welcome back to What's Up With, the World Institute on Disability podcast, where we discuss what's up in the disability community across the globe. If you're new here, I'm your host, Ashley Nkumsa, and on today's episode, I'm chatting with Amy Francis Smith, who is an architect, inclusive accessible design specialist, and multi-award winning design council expert. Amy and I are having a conversation about the importance of accessible housing for people with disabilities. Thank you so much, Amy, for joining me for today's episode of our podcast to discuss the importance of housing accessibility. Now, before we get started, I do want to ask you a question that I ask all of our guests, which is, how are you doing today? Well, today, firstly, thank you for having me. Um, And today I'm in an unusually warm UK. We've got probably the hottest day of the year. And it's sort of 30 degrees centigrade, sort of 86 Fahrenheit, which is about as good as it gets here on a very rare occasion. So uh, I'm sure the rest of the world are laughing at this right now, but I'm I'm feeling it. So apologies if I stop watching yeah. my fan. Absolutely. Do you prefer like hotter weather or like a cold weather? Because you guys kind of get both. So I'm curious to hear, like, do you prefer when it's like hot enough where you can like, you know, comfortably go out and do stuff versus it being super cold? Like, what's your preference on that? <laughs> I think I'm, I'm probably um, one of those... Uh, contradictory people where it's hot I want to be warm, want to be cold and the vice versa. <laughs> I think the autumn is like my favorite midway point really uh, same here me too yeah I am like an autumn fanatic I love it what yeah about- but yeah I'm totally one of those contradictory people as well so it's not just you <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm all about the jump but right now I'm all about I'm looking forward to my jumper um but yeah mm-hmm. I love the sunshine so Absolutely. So let's hop into our questions. If you could tell us about your background in housing accessibility and the work that you currently do, that would be great. Sure. So um, I'm an architect and my sort of work and research has been focused around accessibility probably um, for about 10 years now. And that's come sort of partly through my own experience and through sort of witnessing that around people I've um, close family and friends. And it's kind of just influenced my my practice, um, either through university or through work. And it's sort of something that's developed over time that I just recognise that so many people are struggling and not many people are really realising that. Or like it's something that is kind of almost like a hidden housing crisis all over the world. And it's, it's just not really been talked about enough really especially in, within industry professionals so um, myself I um, initially sort of did some research around accessible housing and obviously I'm sort of a bit biased because I'm UK based so I've got some UK facts I suppose that I sort of um, have found out that roughly in the UK it's about 14.3 million disabled people which is about mm-hmm. about 19% of the population overall so obviously that's a spectrum of different um uh, abilities and maybe you've got vision impairment might not or mobility like, i think mm-hmm. obviously i think maybe wheelchair users around two percent of the population mm-hmm. slightly might be slightly more around in, in more recent months but um of that i found that 1.8 million disabled people are in need of, of accessible housing in the uk and that's you know quite a large chunk of people that are in, in need and i it was sort of something that's really um, touched my heart and through speaking to so many people with my research I probably spoke to hundreds of disabled people more specifically around their housing issues and Mm -hmm. the themes that kept reoccurring were things like people feeling trapped, isolated, feeling a prisoner in their own home. It Mm -hmm. kind of um, conflicted because you know, our home is meant to be our safe space, our where we relax, and where we we have refuge, and come home at the end of the day, and you know, sigh a bit of relief. Um, but for many people, they are sort of fighting a daily battle against the in, inside this space that's meant to be, you know, just for them, and being able to perform daily tasks becomes such a mammoth issue that it. I couldn't not um, focus my work around it, really. 
And I want to talk about some of those issues that make them feel trapped and isolated. What are some of the most common housing accessibility barriers that in your field of work that you've seen people with disabilities are facing? So, it's, you know, some of it could be really simple issues, like simple, um, like obviously I'll focus a bit more on the built environment. So some of it's like, you know, a narrow doorway or a step, like those things are very basic elements that don't take too much to design out or to replace either realistically, or it might be a little bit of logistics, but it's, um, you know, so if you're building a, a new space, then just to sort of not include those is, is really not rocket science. I sort of talk about accessible and inclusive design. Um, some of it is really sort of basic elements. It could be something such as having slightly lower windows or that the fact that the handle is at a lower height. So if someone is spending a lot of time in bed or sat in a chair, then they can actually see out to the world or be able to have uh, fresh air coming in that they can choose to adapt and allow their own space to be responsive to them rather than having to ask someone. So um, some of the things I've found in my discussions with a lot of people, the sort of the some of the tasks that people weren't able to carry out were things like putting their kids to bed for years because they can't get upstairs or be, or having to, um, you know, have to ask to be able to leave the home without, like, in, not being able to do that independently. So you haven't got that autonomy there. Things such as washing in the kitchen sink because they can't get into the bathroom. That is, you know... <laughs> We've all done a bit of a, maybe a, a flannel wet wipe every now and again, if you're camping or at a festival or you've, you know, the water's been cut off, but to do that daily for years is sort of really demeaning and, um, you know, you, you it increases your stress levels because just being able to be in touch with water and or have a bath or have a shower, um, you know, just feels nicer. So there's so many aspects that they, there are issues that I, I had to help people to, to try and overcome because I, you can't leave people in these situations long term because it has such a massive effect on not only their physical health and their mental health, and those two are obviously holistically linked. So the impact can sort of mm-hmm. further um, drive down people's general well-being, especially if you've got mm-hmm. sort of a chronic illness linked in with maybe a kind of mobility issue then you've got sort of compounding effects that are only ever going to make your living situation worse. Yeah. And, you know, what makes it even worse is like the outside environment is so inaccessible for people with disabilities. And then, like you said, it's like your home is supposed to be your refuge where you feel comfort and imagine, you know, what it feels like when your outside environment is inaccessible and so is your home. It's like where... Where can you even have that sense of refuge and, and peacefulness and happiness when everything is so inaccessible? Yeah, no, completely. I, a lot of people ask me more generally, not just around housing, but how can we improve our built environment? How can we improve our, our world, our spaces for people with, with more um, mobility issues? And I always say, you know, people ask me about the workplace, for instance, and how can we bring more people into the workplace? How can we have a more diverse um, staff? And I said, well, how can you expect people to work for you if you don't consider the journey for them to get to to the building? Like, let alone can they even get in that office? But you need to think backwards of how do they get there? Are they on the the bus or the train? Can they physically get on that train? Like in in London, for instance, um, I think a wheelchair user has to wait every third bus to be able to get on the bus because for the space limit the space there even though most of the buses were very fortunate on the whole um do have ramps that come down and do drop down to be able to let people on at a lower flatter level um mm-hmm. you still then got to factor that into your commutes and your length of time so i've brought it right back to the very beginning of how does someone get up for the day can they get dressed and sort of put sort of breakfast out get out of the house um like the very the foundations of, um, you know, how we live our lives and the sort of mm-hmm. the elements that I, I consider 
um, to improve accessibility in a home, like I say, they're, they're, not, they're not particularly difficult. It's slightly wider doorways. It could be something like having a, a downstairs bathroom that um, could potentially be converted into a, a wet room at some point if, if, it's, if it's necessary. Mm -hmm considering things such as sort of level access both in the front door but also to the back out the back so you can get into the garden or the yard mm -hmm. and you know, there's, there's loads of little quite small details that can be done just to um just enhance people's lives mm -hmm. and you mentioned that a lot of these things are not difficult to do so why do you think that there is such a resistance or just a lack of awareness maybe for, you know, housing accessibility when these things are not that difficult to do. So it's probably a multi-pronged reason. And obviously it, there's going to be different variations around the world of who has, you know, where you're living and where you're based. I think ultimately it's, well, there's, there's sort of the top down issues. So that's coming down from government and from policy makers and from sort of legislation that's um, in place. You've also got things such as um, in the UK, for example, most of the housing stock is um, at least 50 to 70 years old, if not older. So these kind of things just weren't considered then. So you've got a lot of existing homes that are, um, you know, Victor a Victorian terrace house, for instance, that is absolutely beautiful and it's a, um, but it has, uh, quite a grand staircase going up to the front door for instance and those things just weren't really particularly acknowledged at that time when things were being built so you're then faced with um, things such as um, it, it could be trying to adapt an, an existing building versus trying to find a new build and as I was saying about legislation it could be the local design guidance or regulations have different um, percentages. Uh, not even everyone has them, to be fair, around accessible housing. And and typically they're more associated with um, sort of social housing or people, sort of people that are in need of, or maybe a lower income. So there's sort of very specific categories of people that might be able to even join a waiting list to have more accessible housing. So it's it's kind of, um, like I say, it's a multi-pronged tactic. It could e it, even, it's just about a social awareness and, 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 and on a societal level about people understanding mm -hmm. that, you know, eight out of 10 disabled people aren't born with a disability. They're sort of acquired at some point through their lifetime. And, and, and obviously there's a sort of correlation between your age and having a physical uh, or sort of impairment. So the older you are, the more likely you are to have to be in need of um, additional considerations for your home. And again, it doesn't mm -hmm. need to be, a, it could just be having a few grab rails or like a slightly taller raised seat for toilets. It doesn't need to be, you know, home, a whole home redesign with a lift and a, a hoist and a, a stair lift, say. Um, and what I found quite often is some of the, the homes that are slightly more accessible are kitted out with products that are pretty ugly. And I'm, pre and I, I <laughs> you know exactly what I mean. There's those grey, yeah. cream graying like grab rails. There's like some weird sort of awkward adap like adaptions that have been done that you know your grandma hates, let alone everyone else. <laughs> you wouldn't want it in your home so you know people buy a house and go well I don't need this I don't want this and they strip it out and then you suddenly lost that home that had previously um been slightly sort of could have potentially been used for someone that that needed those those elements and then you've suddenly lost you're gonna have to regain it again so one of the things I uh, advocate for is and sort of fully encourage is that accessible design doesn't have to be the sort of awkward ugly considerations that we all kind of assume it, it, it they are it could be something very s seamless and uh, integrated that is quite subtle so generally i sort of um 
So I, I give talks to and sort of t lecture at universities to architecture students who are, you know, I'm trying to get in there early before they become jaded by the industry and the, all the other regulations <laughs> yeah. they need to um, adhere to and get them to realise that good inclusive design or universal design, um, the principles wouldn't the whole point is that they're not noticed by the general public by people using them they, they just universally make everyone's lives easier and better and you know that could be mm -hmm. something such as you know I'm, I'm no doubt some people listening today are parents and they've had had fight with trying to get buggies and prams just through a front door up and down steps and having those elements actually make everyone's lives easier um, or things such as intergenerational housing or having your, your grandma come to live with you or, you know, it could be a temporary that you break your leg for six months and you're shuffling up and down the stairs on your ass. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, you know, those kind of things can make everyone's lives better. Did you know WID offers accessibility solutions and universal design services that support companies and organizations of all sizes via disability-led surveys and focus groups, user experience testing, climate assessments and audits, training and advisory services? WID offers this service to drive better design and accessible experiences for employees, clients, and customers. Ready to learn more? Visit our website at www.wid.org slash accessibility dash services to book an appointment with us today. What advice would you give to, you know, architects and even landscapers and other housing authority personnel when it comes to building accessible housing? Because it can seem overwhelming, you know, for those people, like you mentioned, who are jaded, who've been doing things one way for so long, how do they then, you know, kind of change course and, you know, build accessible housing, what advice would you give to them? Well, obviously, it's, it stems from the, the sort of the legal responsibility of your area or your area code or your um, local authority. So you've got to start with your your baseline minimum. So for the UK, with, for instance, the building regulations, um, part M, which is the sort of document that focuses around accessibility, is often used as quite a, um, a, a high quality standard to achieve for access um but it's actually the barest minimum it's not something to aim for it's the baseline legal requirements so obviously other places will have similar or hopefully will have a similar type of uh, standard but i would recommend people looking at uh, part m or um if you want to get really technical um there's bs 8300 which is the british standards which is um, goes into a lot more depth and, and sort of suggestions around a whole pile of different sectors and so not just housing but it could be um, public spaces hospitals um, theatres shopping centres you know the works kind of thing so it's about realising that even if you don't achieve a fully like so you, you're basically just try your best to try to be mm -hmm. empathetic and to consider that there are people beyond your own um, lived experience. It could be something simple as just asking your local, asking your friend, asking, I, I, I'm sure most people have connections and I, I always um, really am a big advocate for sort of user-led design. So rather than having the, the architect ego say, oh yeah, I, I know what people need. Um, you know, you can't presume to know what it's like to, I don't know what it's like to be blind, personally. I have a hearing impairment and I, I've got a bunch of other stuff and I've previously been in a, um, a wheelchair user, but I've, I, it's not a lived experience for me, so I can't presume to know what prefer people's preferences are. And it's, mm -hmm. it's also kind of acknowledging that now, I do say to people, I don't I don't believe you can have a fully accessible building or space because it's it's so contradictory. I, I you know, a wheelchair user is generally gonna prefer a lift or a ramp 
because, you know, for obvious reasons, there's no stairs there. But I know a lot of people who are crutches users who hate ramps because quite often they feel a bit unsteady. The angle can hurt their knees or their hips. If it's icy mm -hmm. or wet, then you, it's, quite, it's a slip hazard. So you kind of, it's about having choice. It's about sort of recognising your user group and considering the types of people that are going to be in that area. So you know, I, I did a bit of work for a charity that is for children with vision impairments. So there's there's going to be a, a high percentage of people who obviously have vision impairment, but also there's going to be a high percentage of uh, guide dogs or sort of assisted assisted uh, dogs for those people. So then considering that as an aspect of, okay, well, where do the dogs go? Have they got somewhere to go to the toilet? Have they got drinking water? Like it suddenly then has like a knock on effect. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's also, I'll get back to the actual question you asked, um, what's the advice? <laughs> I think it's just being, having that extra level of consideration and empathy there. And, um, you know, sort of, not just saying oh well, that'll do because you've ticked a box because you've got a toilet and a lift like that's kind of it's very tokenistic it's quite a, it's a it's kind of the barest minimum gesture rather than actually considering that you know like the fact that our world is quite diverse is actually an exciting design challenge personally like you you know just take starting from disability as being a kind of um almost like a not a problem to resolve but it, it's a it, it adds fuel to the, that kind mm -hmm. of initial brief for a designer to kind of think okay actually I can this is quite exciting like, I can come at this from a completely different angle than I normally would do or I've been taught at university or at school uh, or college and use that as like inspiration to create something that is actually quite drastically different from what a lot of your other peers might be creating. So, um, yeah, it is possible. Like I say, it's, even if it's just so, something is better than nothing because I know someone will thank you for it. Mm -hmm. Right, and we talked about universal and inclusive design. Why is it so important that that is something that's utilized and prioritized? Why, why does it matter so much? Well, so, a few points I've mentioned already that you know it you know even just on a very selfish individualistic level it might mean that you in the future could use that space like you might suddenly have an issue mm -hmm. that might come through into your life or a loved one and quite often it's not until people have a personal experience of something do they suddenly realize oh this world is not designed for us it's not created for us and it's yeah. It can suddenly suddenly be quite a big headache, and you know, maybe you've had an accident, or maybe there's, um, you know, there's a difficult childbirth, or you know, any different situation, and you then have other bigger issues that you need to tackle, and you know, it could just be going to medical appointments or trying to get um, funding or try to get help in other ways people shouldn't have to have to also then argue and fight for the ability to to get into a shopping center or to or, um you know access a bank like those elements mm -hmm. just really hinder people's day-to-day -day lives so i um i'm kind of here to sort of um help give a voice to people who are having to fight those daily battles and haven't got the energy and the time to, you know, have every single fight with every single shopkeeper. And um, it, it, the kind of the clues also in the name, like the universal is everyone. We all benefit from it. There's, there's a level of um, integration that every member of society will, will appreciate. And, you know, I think, Quite a lot of us have um, all around the world, obviously through COVID and through the pandemic, a lot of people got told, stay at home, you work here now, this is your life, you're in this box. And people started to realise, oh, this space does not work for me. This is really awkward. That I, I've got backache, I'm trying to 
you know, I haven't got a desk that's very ergonomic. I'm trying to awkwardly just like sit on a sofa with your laptop on your on your on your desk, and it's those kind of elements that you sort of realise that when your space doesn't work for you, it makes life difficult, and it sort of adds that extra level of stress that people just don't need. So there's it kind of gave. I believe quite a few people are in a sort of exposure to um, realizing that other people have been having facing like maybe not exactly the same, but like a similar type of awkward place where you know, a lot of people have moved now or gone mm-hmm. to find places that have outdoor spaces or better fresh air because mm-hmm. we're reprioritizing what, what how we want to live our lives, and mm-hmm. for disabled people that just isn't always an option to be able to just move to because the housing just isn't there to move to um Mm -hmm. or equally if you have got a home that is does kind of work for you a lot of people have to stay there because where else do you go like there isn't a um you know the rented sector is probably one of the worst for people with um mobility issues because it's it's not public it's not uh in, like, landlords aren't massively infused or haven't been educated or made aware that if they actually had more accessible properties to let out you've actually got a, a, a niche market that they will people will rent those and will stay there for probably quite a long time and they'll be the perfect tenant because they will be so well not shouldn't have to be thankful but they will be thankful that they have an accessible home because it's such a uh, a restricted market so it's kind of like even on a very baseline financial business mindset having things more accessible actually brings a wider a range of people into your company into your business into your whatever um and in the uk sorry to keep referencing the uk uh, stats but there's something called what we call the purple pound so um, 249 billion pounds annually is that the collective spend for disabled people that's like disposable income that's the money that disabled people have choice and options to distribute as they see fit and that's a, a, a large market that just is untapped like businesses on a you know ignoring the the legal side the ethical the moral issues the you know we should do because it's better for everyone just on like a business level you're you're opening up a potential boom there so yeah absolutely and you know i think of the fact that you know people with disabilities are obviously so financially disadvantaged and um you know we talked about earlier the idea that older homes tend to be less accessible versus newer homes or newer you know buildings are more accessible but of course newer buildings cost significantly more money to live in. So how would you say that, you know, people with disabilities can advocate for themselves when they're, you know, living in inaccessible spaces, especially when they're so financially disadvantaged? How does one even begin to advocate for themselves? Well, it's a big bomb. Um, I suppose it's, again, there's a, there's a varying ways you can tackle it. You can, it could be quite a, a small uh, macro scale where, you um, discuss amongst your community or your neighbours, or you try and um, sort of raise awareness in a very in a much smaller area. It could be um, sort of tapping in using social media to sort of raise awareness and campaign around the, the, the points, or to try and help influence and explain, um, you know, show people this is how a lot of people are living. This is how. Um, my day-to-day tasks are sort of hindered and use that as an example to sort of help people recognise it because most people have, I would say people, like most the general public have no idea, realistically, unless it no. comes to them or it comes to their family member and suddenly realise that, oh, this system is not set up for us. Um, there is no help there. there. Everyone just probably just assumes oh, it, you know, the government will give you some aid or there'll be somewhere for you to move to locally. Um, and that just isn't the case often. So it's kind of about making some noise um, and 
and it doesn't need to be you know by all means go chain yourself to a railing I did not advocate for that but you know what I mean <laughs> you know you, there's different ways you can do it you, you can make you can make it, you can make a lot of noise from your bed if if you need to it could also be around talking to the local authorities trying to discuss on a wider level trying to sort of campaign on a policy level so sort of a, a lot of the work that I do um I I'm sort of possibly t- I'm sort of well, t- targeting multiple levels but I I do quite a lot of campaigning changing the design building regulations which is a national policy so by all means I can I can help m- multiple people on a, on an individual basis or on a sort of a local area basis but or I can sort of help teach other architects and designers to then disseminate that information out and hopefully it sort of seeds through into other people's practice but I realized that the only way that real change can happen is on a much wider uh, scale. So um, I, I, I've sort of targeted the, the higher end so that the, the, um, the law is there to back you up. So then rather than having housing developers or um, builders sort of meeting, you know, the local planning policy or their sort of local percentage allocations of accessible housing um as a sort of token sort of you know a good marketing thing of oh aren't we good that we've done this charitable thing that is sort of out of the faith of our hearts and um mm-hmm. whereas actually if if everyone has to do it then there is absolutely sort of much of a widespread mandate so um i think I, I i don't want to have to make people disabled people do all the work like sh- they shouldn't have to be the ones that are fighting this and unfortunately quite often they are and having to fight a, few, a lot of other battles as well at the same time and um you know personally i've um you know I'm, i sound like sometimes i'm speaking on behalf of disabled people but i'm also disabled myself like i um you know about eight years ago i was bedridden um for several years i um, so I've got mast cell activation syndrome, which was sort of putting me into anaphylaxis almost daily. Uh, I was in that hospital. I've got Crohn's, got Ellis Danlos syndrome, which affects my joints and my my sort of mobility. So um, on the outside, I look like a functioning normal human, but I've also sort of partial hearing loss. But sort of I've 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 known chronic fatigue. I've known struggle. I've known sort of having my life extremely limited to you know four walls. And I'm quite fortunate that I've been able to have uh, an increased energy and um, through those kind of experiences, giving me passion and drive to mm-hmm. help other people because I'm, I'm quite fortunate, I'm privileged that I've, I've, I've been um, given, you know, I live in the UK, I've had an education um, of maintenance bursaries that meant I've been able to access university. Um, not it's not free for everyone but I was I it wasn't free for me either but I had some help um mm-hmm. and being able to be an architect as a professional in the construction industry in the design industry has meant that I can be an advocate for people who don't get to go into those kinds of rooms who don't get to talk to the people in power um to try and help things so everyone has their own specialism or like way of tackling things some people wanted to bang a loud drum and make a lot of noise other people would rather you know do things through the internet or um sort of maybe it could just be simple as simple as emailing your local shopkeeper or asking your local uh, representative why things not why why are you not representing me um it's 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 like I say it shouldn't be for up to disabled people like yeah. hopefully the more I educate other people and the more other people um sort of become aware of the of the topic and obviously the work that you guys are doing yourselves spreads out to people who are hopefully allies and sort of can help look sort of be that be that voice for people who aren't there and quite often I I ask people look around the room and ask yourself who isn't here and why aren't they here and how could I help bring everyone to that table and it, you know it could be on a say very small level it could be like on a much larger level and we've all got 
a position that we can help people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And my last question is kind of an overarching question of all that we've been discussing today. Why does accessible housing matter? Why is it important? You know, what is one takeaway that you would want our listeners to come away from this episode with? Why does housing accessibility matter so much? Housing accessibility matters. This is your quote here. I'm just trying to give you your headline for this. Um, <laughs> it matters because we all deserve it. Just ultimately, we all deserve autonomy, dignity, independence. It's 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 a basic human right to be able to uh, be treated as, as everyone else is, and everyone else, um, I say, everyone else who living in homes that you know might not be perfect for them, it might not be the the ideal situation. They don't need to, you know. They won't want to move, but people have freedom and choice and option. And if you're living in an inaccessible space, you are really limiting your life or having your life limited. And it's it's just about realising that everyone deserves empathy. And we, I say we as a society, designers, architects, um, landscapers, we have designed and built our world. Someone, man, man, women made world that we have someone, someone's thought about, uh, I'll put these steps in or I will make this too narrow or I will make this beautiful thing that is only, a, 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 only half the people of the population can um, visit. There's no need for it. Like we've designed it in so we can design it out. It's as simple as that. Absolutely. I just think that, again, I want to emphasize what you said earlier. Obviously, the onus is not on people with disabilities to advocate for themselves. You know, the onus is for the people that create and that build these spaces. So I think that, you know, if we all come together to prioritize accessibility in the built environment, accessibility in our homes, it's going to make a world of difference for for everyone, because at, at the end of the day, everyone benefits from accessibility. So it's all of our responsibilities and it's not a luxury. It's, it's a necessity at this point. So. Completely. Yeah. I, th- I think some of one of the other things I, I like to help um, enthuse, I suppose, is I don't want to have, it shouldn't always be non-disabled people or able-bodied people designing for disabled no. people it should be with mm-hmm. and it should be by so i'm mm-hmm. a huge advocate for bringing more disabled people into the, the conversation into the industry into um, education spaces and being you know part of part of like why they're not more disabled architects in the uk there are um i think unregistered architects they you have to legally be registered to call yourself an architect here one percent of all architects have declared themselves with a disability and six percent has sort of preferred not to disclose so that shows you as a potential that there's more of a stigma around having a disability than there is like announcing it almost so there's Mm -hmm. there's a huge area where we could all benefit from having more diverse voices alternative life um, um, experiences and opinions and that kind of depth and breadth of um, different background can really help influence the design. Your work, the work that you're doing is such a great testament to that, that, you know, people with disabilities have to have a seat at the table when building, you know, environments for people with disabilities. So totally, totally agree with you on that point. So back to the uh, the classic slogan, nothing about us without us. Absolutely. That's exactly it. You exemplify that every day in the work that you do. So really appreciate you for having this conversation with me and in all the amazing work that you do to advocate for people with disabilities. It's just been such a pleasure to sit down and chat with you today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And hopefully it's helps give people a little bit of fire and inspiration to, um, you know, fight the good fight. Like I say, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I've chosen my battle, my corner that I try and um, help influence the world with. And I, 
I don't mind what it is. It could be, you know, you could help the, the old lady on your street. It could be picking up litter. It could be um, around sustainability. It could be around making accessible transport. I don't, I don't mind as long as, as, as long as people are kind of infused to help make our world better collectively. Mm-hmm. And it could be such a small, it could be a massive thing. Um, but if we can all sort of choose our own little battles, hopefully, collectively, we will win the war. Mm -hmm. We all have our parts to play when it comes to accessibility, for sure. Completely. Thank you so much once again to Amy for this wonderful conversation about housing accessibility. It's always a pleasure to chat with people with disabilities who are working diligently to make society more inclusive for other people with disabilities. I'd like to also thank you all at home for tuning into today's episode. And I want to let you know that because accessibility is a top priority for WID, this episode and all of our past episodes of our podcast are available with transcripts as well as American Sign Language on our website at www.wid.org slash what's dash up dash WID. I hope you all enjoyed today's episode and I can't wait to have you back again for our next episode and make sure that you're following our podcast on your favorite podcast platform so you're notified when the next episode drops so you never miss out on What's Up with Wid.